Thank you very much, Remy. And he downplayed it. I've, I've sent a lot of CFPs to this conference. Um, and uh, this is a conference I've been attending since back in 2014. And one thing I love about this conference is that there's so many talks that I can go look, look back on, right? I can go back and look at talks and share them with junior engineers, say, look at this talk. It's going to be one that's going to change how you think about things, right? But I don't want that to be true about this talk. I want th this talk to be a talk that we fix all the problems that I'm going to talk about so that we don't have to have this talk in the future. So I want to start this talk by saying every neurodivergent individual is different. And I'm going to share my personal journey. And, and this is the first time I've talked about this, so I'm very nervous. <laughs> uh, but um, I think it's really important I tell my story so I can give context for the rest of the talk. That's, that said, I also need to point out that uh, because everyone is, is different, my lived experience is on my own. So I'm going to share talk about general symptoms and, 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 and of the conditions, people, so, you're, so you're, you're aware of them. So we're going to start in the north of England. So I grew up in the north of England and throughout my schooling there was always ways which I was, I struggled but I was but just never seen as being out of the ordinary. Where I was struggling with my writing, the teachers suggested that I should try a different pen. Where I struggled with paying attention, uh, it was made into a joke that, oh, Jonathan looked out the window and distracted the entire class by pointing to an aeroplane. And where I struggled with social situations, my parents pushed me into things like scouts that forced me to meet new people. And it all came to a head in college when one of the other students noticed how disorganised I was and suggested that the Special Education Needs Department might be able to help. I, of course, was apprehensive and probably very dismissive. But however, she insisted I spoke to someone about what I was struggling with. And the, the, the person in the person department I spoke to explained both dyslexia and dyspraxia. And that, from that, the experience that I shared with her, that it might be worth me getting assessed. I then met with an educational psychologist who asked me lots of questions. Uh, they went through things like my, uh, my reading speed, my reading comprehension, uh, my writing speed and the, the readability of my handwriting with the aim to understand what I struggled with. Then I went away and wrote up a report detailing my dyslexia and, and dyspraxia assessment which offered up ways in which my college could support me. I got access to things like extra time in exams, unit computer for my exams so that my, tech, my written text not being readable didn't, didn't hurt my, my scores and that resulted in me in actually finishing exams for once because I had the, the time to actually read and comp comprehend the questions. I subsequently went on to university where I studied internet computing which at the time was actually a very niche subject that, that was offered by a few universities and I was able to continue to take advantage of that enhanced support. I then went on to, went on to graduate in 2008 and after a couple of short roles, I, I, I was able to set into a role at a marketing agency called Crayon. And as I started, I, I started to get more established in my career, I also started to get more involved in the tech community. I went to my first uh, tech conference, which was the first jQuery conference, which was hosted in Oxford. But from my perspective, though, I found it awkward to attend these events. And internally, I struggled with meeting new people. When I attended meetups, for example, I would often find myself feeling awkward and alone. I, but keep, I kept sending these meetups because I, f I felt that I was learning so much about different technologies and I knew this would be good for me and my career. And I eventually started, started to make friends. So I was able to talk to others when attending, attending events. And there's actually quite a few of these, these people here today. And that's why I felt safe, safe, safe to talk about this subject. I then took the next step and started speaking at meetups and, and subsequently con conferences much like this one. This was in fact easier because people, instead of having to strike up conversations myself, they would come to me. They would be asking me questions and then I don't have to start the conversations. And I feel a lot awkward. And as I continued my career, I, worked, I started working at a few different startups. And I, I was pushing myself outside my comfort zone all the time, going to meetups, talking at them, and talking at conferences. However, I switched into, as I switched into more senior roles, I, I, I got started to really struggle with imposter syndrome, as was talked about earlier. And after a very bad um, anxiety spiral during the COVID pandemic, I started to learn about what autism was. And, it's, I, I, and ironically, I started hyperfixating on it. 
re re reading a lot about it and taking all the online quizzes I could find. And, and after, after talking with my wife, she encouraged me, just get yourself assessed. And being a software engineer, I'm in the very privileged position that I could afford to pay for a private assessment. Many people, unfortunately, can't. And, and eight weeks later, I found out I was autistic. And this was eye-opening for me. And since then, I've learned so much about myself because I'm able to see what the symptoms are and like, oh, that's how, that's how it is for me. Or, and, and, how, and then when I'm able to talk to people about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's why I do this. And, and then, um, actually, a, a year ago, I found myself looking for a new role for the first time with this information. And that's really interesting because you get asked questions like, do you need any accommodations for your interviews? And I was like, I don't know. I've never done this before. Um, uh, and then um, I, I, but I, I, it ruled out some companies for me because I was like, no, I don't feel that they would support me. Um, and then in, in January, I joined Spendesk. So around the time I got my autism diagnosis, I also learned the term neurodiversity. And now let's, I want to share that all with you. So I've shared my personal journey and that's brought me up to speak, speaking here today. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the so, so different kind of neurodiversity and the conditions that, that themselves. And before I jump into the section, I want to caveat it very strongly by saying that I'm not a psychologist. And while I have tried to be as accurate as possible, that this is based on personal research. And where I talk about symptoms, I've taken these directly from the NHS website, just to ensure this to preserve accuracy. So when I first started researching this topic, the, the, the first time I uh, started talking about it, which was at work, was I found this blog post on the Harvard, Harvard website. And it describes it so well, I wanted to share it, share it with you as well. Neurodiversity describes the idea that people experience and interact with the world around them in many different ways. There is no one right way to think, learn, or behave, and differences are viewed as deficits. And when people's brains work differently from the norm, they are referred to as neurodivergent. This means that where people have strengths and struggles, that this means people have different strengths and struggles from people whose brains develop or work more typically. The, the possible differences include medical disorders, learning disabilities, and, the, and other conditions. And possible strengths can be a better memory, the ability to solve complex mathematical calculations in the head, and even be able to think about problems in many different ways. Unfortunately, neurodiverse conditions have been consistently underdiagnosed, and due to, the lack of, due to both lack of awareness and insufficient resources for things like the NHS. In particular, sh a shortage of child psychologists right now means that there's waiting lists up to five years in the UK at the moment for children. And this means that it's incredibly difficult to estimate the number of neurodivergent people we have in the UK. And the common estimate that, that I can find online is one in seven, but it's impossible to truly know. And due to this underdiagnosis in children, we then have a large number of people as in adults seeing these things in themselves and then going for diagnosis themselves. Which means also the adult services are now under heavy, heavy pressure, with many people getting turned away because only people who it's negatively impacting are, are actually being prioritised. And um, an impo it's important to, to, to point out that neurodiversity is a spectrum. However, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people about this. They often think this is what I mean, that a spectrum is neurotypical on one end and neurodivergent on the other, and that is not the case. When we talk about the neurodiversity spectrum, what we actually mean is a series of traits a person have more or less of. This means, like a person's fingerprints, a person's traits is completely unique to them. And it's really important to make this distinction as it truly shows how diverse neurodiversity is and highlights that the support that an individual needs can, be significant, can vary significantly from person to person. And while, and while these traits vary from person to person, often you won't be able to see these traits yourself because they, and how they affect them because they've become so good at hiding them. This is referred to as masking. It's an unconscious strategy that all humans develop when growing up in order to connect and, with those around us. However, for neurodivergent folk, it can be, it, it, they have a lot, of, a lot more pressure to hide their true selves and spend their entire lives hiding their traits and trying to fit in. This in itself can be harmful to their own well-being and can, and can result in people being not being diagnosed until later in life because they've been so good at hide, hiding their condition. 
So uh, uh, many of you might be thinking, what conditions are, are neurodiversities? So now we're going to have a look at, at five different conditions. For each of the neurodiversities I'm going to talk about, I will talk about the condition itself, and then I'm going to dispel some of the negative stereotypes, sorry, uh, typically associated, highlighting instead the strengths uh, that they can bring to the workplace. So I'm going to go through them in alphabetical order, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about ADHD, autism, dyslexia, dys dyspraxia, and dyscalculia. There is, all, there is a, there's many more conditions, however, I didn't have time to speak to them today. I don't think me would like me to take, take the entire conference. <laughs> a lot of these symptoms, can, things can coexist as well. So, for example, I have a autism, dyslexia, and dyspraxia assessment, and uh, I, there's many, many people have multiple of these assessments. So, let's start with ADHD. So, ADHD is short for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which is diagnosed to people who struggle with inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. And, and th those, the, the symptoms that, that come with ADHD are categorised in two categories. The first of which is inattentiveness, which is categorised as being someone with having a short attention span and being easily distracted, making careless mistakes, appearing forgetful or losing things, being unable to stick to tasks that are tedious or time consuming, appearing to be unable to listen or carry out instructions, or having difficulty organising tasks. And then there is the other category, which actually I think ADHD is probably more known for, which is hyperactivity and impulsiveness, which can be constantly fidgeting, being unable to concentrate on tasks, excessive talking and disrupting of conversations, being unable to wait their turn, acting without thinking, and little or no sense of danger. So we've, now we've taken the time to understand the symptoms, let's look at some of the stereotypes. And the first stereotype that you, that you, that you often hear is that people with ADHD will be, are hyperactive, running all over the place. When in reality, for, for, for a lot of people with ADHD, it's an internalised hyperactivity, which is like a very busy, noisy mind. And no, another stereotype is that ADHD is, people, they're always interrupting conversations. But the reality is it, they struggle with the social cues of, trying, of when they're allowed to talk. And even they might be worried that they're going to forget what they're going to say. Uh, so, so they need to actually um, say it. I know even when I've been talking at conferences, I've been asked questions, I've forgotten the question before I finished the answer. So I, I, it, it, it really, so, so I know that can be really frustrating for people. And unable to concentrate on tasks. The next, um, when the reality is that they're, 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 they're actually thinking about five to six different things simultaneously and they're struggling with the prioritisation. And the final stereotype I want to talk about is being forgetful. When we ask, they're often self-aware that they have issues with short-term memory, so they're doing everything they can, making notes and reminders to try and remember things. Um, so what I want to do in this next section was start to reframe how we think about those, those, those symptoms. Because when you look on the NHS website, they can come across quite negative. So one of them is short attention span. However, this can be reframed as being able to rap rapidly change their focus to new tasks, which can be good in an environment where you're rapidly context switching. We can also reframe acting without thinking, be able to respond quickly in a crisis. Imagine, imagine when you have an incident, so someone who can respond quickly in a crisis is going to be able to, to help get, get that fixed quicker. And finally, we can reframe their imp impulsiveness as having the courage to try new things. Mean, meaning if, if there's a, a, a problem that the, that the team is having, they might think of a solution that, that no one else would be willing to try. Having spoken about the challenges that come with the symptoms, I want to talk about some of the strengths, because there's many strengths as well. So pe people with ADHD are often more creative, which in a development role could be uh, mean that they come up with creative and out-of-the-box ideas to solve problems they're tasked with. A state of hyperfocus, which is common for people with ADHD, can allow them to zoom in on a, one particular task and achieve a lot in this, a small amount of time. And people with ADHD are often more, more risk tolerant, meaning they're, w they're willing to try, this, try those solutions that others might not be willing to try. So if, so if, if some, someone in your team is, is open enough that they feel they can tell you that they have ADHD, how can you support them? 
So the first is to make sure you're, sure you're using short-term goals. So you work as a team, uh, work as a team to, to break things into smaller deliverables that can be achieved in a small amount of time. The second is to support them in their time management by confirming what tasks, when tasks need to be done by, highlighting important parts using calendars and even stand-ups as a way to track deadlines. And you can, you, can, you, can also, you can also help them by helping them get started. So, so, sometimes they might be str struggling with starting a new piece of work. Uh, so you can support them by maybe doing a spike with them into what the possible solution could be, and then you could build the fa the, 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 uh, then they can go away and build the final solution. The next one I want to talk, want to talk about is autism. So autism is a diagnosis uh, given to people who have challenges with communication, interacting with other people, understanding how people think or feel, finding things bright lights or loud noises overwhelming, stressful, uncomfortable, getting anxious or upset about unfamiliar situations and social events, taking longer to understand information, and doing or thinking the same thing over and over. And, the si and, and those symptoms are broadly categorised in three categories of communication and interaction with others, interests and behaviours, and work and life impact functions. So again, we're going to look at stereotypes for diversity reality. I think autism has quite a few that have been perpetuated by the media. So the first one I want to touch on is people with autism wanting to be, things to be done their way. When reality is, it is often the struggle with situations outside what they're prepared for. So it's, say you move a meeting an hour, hour earlier, they're now, 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 now not going to be as prepared as they would otherwise would have been. Uh, another stereotype that autistic people are savants or possess exceptional talents, and this is particularly played out in the media. How in reality, people with, with autism have a wide variety of skills, just like people who are neurotypical. And there is also the uh, stereotype that autistic people prefer to be alone. But the, the reality is that they struggle with interpreting social uh, cues and situations, which leads them to isolate themselves. And lastly, it's common for people to think autistic people lack empathy or emotion. However, the reality is that they, struggle, they might struggle with expressing and processing emotions, but it doesn't mean they lack them at all. So let's uh, have a go at reframing uh, the symptoms about autism. So let's start with autistic people have a repetitive nature. This can be reframed as analytical, being able to spot patterns and this can be valuable when you're trying to analyse a technical problem or some, or some data. Next week, we can reframe autistic people coming across blunt or rude as simply being, having a more direct form of communication, often rooted in black and white thinking mindset. And lastly, autistic people might come across as uninterested in others' opinions. However, we can reframe that as not understanding the social cues that their ideas have been understood by their peers, so feeling that they have to reiterate upon them. And if when we dive into the strengths that are associated with autism, we can see there are many strengths that they bring to the workplace. For example, a, st a strength in log logical thinking, and and, oh, sorry, for, a strength, uh, for example, a, a strength in logical and methodological think thinking can help someone with autism to solve complex problems. A strong attention to detail can, be, can help with spotting errors and mistakes meaning they actually can be really good when to send your pull requests to them because they're going to be able to spot, spot the silly mistakes we make. And passionate about their interests. So passion for the interests means they're likely to find a role that aligns with their interests and, and a passion for building the best product for the, their users. Right? I mean, my, pa my, my passion is coding, so I, I, I was able to land right in the, the right industry. And, bec and because they themselves are, are, are different and they can see themselves different, uh, they're, they're really good at accepting differences in others, which reminds them they're going to be the kind of people who are going to be pu pushing for things like access accessibility on your team. To help someone with autism get the most out of their strengths, there is a number of ways in, you, in, in that you can support them. The first is having a clear and consistent schedule and providing additional support when the schedule becomes disrupted. As I touched on earlier, changing a meeting time at last minute can be disruptive to them, so avoid that where possible. And with the return to office since COVID, many companies are keeping smaller offices with hot desking is more common. F uh, for someone with autism, this can make them feel uncomfortable as they like the consistency of knowing where they'll sit in the office and, uh, and who will be around them. 
And speaking of the office, it's important that we're able to work in an environment without sensory distractions. So ideally a quieter area of the office with less people uh, walking past that, that, that could distract them. And finally, when sending them a meeting invite, provide them with as much detail as possible so they're, not, so they're able to plan ahead. Don't send them a meeting that's a one-to-one -one with your manager and make them feel a little anxious. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about is dyscalculia. And I, I wanted to carry out this one. This is the hardest one to research. So dyscalculia is a diagnosis given to people who may have challenges with performing mathematical equations, retaining numerical information, a lack of confidence with numbers, poor time management, and giving or following directions. And, the and, and, and for this to be classified as a learning disability, it's for people who are demonstrating that the mathematical difficulties are not caused by lack of educational opportunities, and the degree of difficulties evidence to be below the expectations of the individual's age. So when we start looking at stereotypes, let's, let, let's start with the common misconception that people with dyscalculia can't count. When the reality is that people with dyscalculia are simply find counting and calculating more difficult. So they might be slower, but it doesn't mean they're unable. Another stereotype is that, is that people who say they want dyscalculia is just using it as an excuse for being bad at math. When, re re when rea it, reality is that dyscalculia is more common than people expect, with an estimated 5-7% of the population uh, struggling with it. And lastly, there's a stereotype that people with dyscalculia lack intelligence. How however, the reality is that it's a neurological con condition and it has uh, no relation to, to the le their level of intelligence, and it, and it just affects their ability to process numerical information. So let's have a go at, dis at uh, reframing those symptoms of dyscalculia. So slow to comprehend mathematical equations is simply a, a different way of processing information and finding it difficult to give or follow, follow directions. We can reframe that as, a, as, a, as being better at working more closely with others to reach a solution together. And, this, and let's look at strengths. So the research has found that people with uh, this, this calculator are usually more creative and have, and have autistic flair. The, the second is that they, are, they have innovative problem solving, uh, which can help your team solve more complex problems in unique, 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 uniquely simple ways. And the final um, strength I want to touch on is they typically have good written and verbal communication skills, which in an engineering team is amazing because they are able to help you with, your, uh, with improving your documentation and even presenting things in workshops. And if you're talking about uh, recommended support systems, if you're, if you're going to have a meeting, make sure you supply all the figures in advance so they, have time, so they, can, they can take their time to, com to comprehend the data in advance so they can come prepared. Where you're comparing two pieces of data, use visual representations, such as pie charts or bar charts, so they can see the differences in sizes. Present only the essential data. Don't, don't, include, all, uh, don't include data that is, is not going to be talked about or, in, or important to the meeting. And, and another aspect I didn't touch on much earlier was like make sure that like having alerting to help with timekeeping. So making sure maybe using calendars or, t or tools that help with timekeeping. Dyslexia. So dyslexia is a diagnosis given to people who have challenges with reading and writing very slowly, having poor and inconsistent spelling, understanding information told verbally and having difficulty with information that's written down and planning an organisation. And, and to be categorised as a learning difficulty, a disability, it, 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 it does occur over a, over a wide range of intellectual difficult, uh, sorry, occurs across a, a range of intellectual abilities and it affects their reading, writing and information processing. So dyslexia I think is quite known about, but, there's, but I think there is a lot of stereotypes that also are associated with it. So the, the really common one is dyslexic people can't read. When, rea when reality is they just find it more difficult to uh, de decode and comprehend written text. And in my own personal experience, or people I know, it's, pos it's possible that someone with dyslexia is the 95th percentile of ability to read the text. They just then struggle with the comprehension. And another stereotype is that people with dyslexia simply need to try harder. When reality is, it is it's completely unrelated. The amount of effort is not related to their ability to read. 
And there's also a misconception that dyslexia is a visual problem. When in fact a per person who, sorry, a visual problem, when in fact a person with dyslexia is no more or less likely to have a vision problem. And to ensure that vision isn't an issue during the assessments, they, before performing a, dys a dyslexia assessment, the person has to have a recent eye test. And this, this ensures that the problem isn't, isn't, isn't to do with the, your eye test, it's to do with thing. Oh, I forgot to click the slide. Cool. Um, and lastly, the stereotype that, that people with dyslexia do not read enough. However, the re reality is that with a neurological condition, exposure does not impact it does not exposure does not impact their ability to read. So uh, let's do the reframing uh, with, with dyslexia. So slow to read the same text as others. We can reframe that as simply processing written content differently. We can reframe a difficulty in note taking as an ability is, is, is having is learning to adapt how they keep track of information and not using that as their primary way. Maybe they use audio recording, so they record re record that meeting rather than write, write notes. And if we look at strengths, um, there is a lot of research that's shown that uh, people, people with dyslexia have good uh, visual spatial reasoning, which, which meaning that they think with mental images. This means they're able to think multiple steps ahead, identifying mistakes that they need to avoid when building out a solution. Perfect for engineering. They, they might also have strong imagination, meaning they imagine new solutions to problems uh, a lot more easier. And, and beyond having simply having a strong imagination, they're good at thinking outside the box. And while they struggle with reading and writing, areas that do not depend on this as much, such as maths and computing, um, they find a lot easier and it can be a real strength. To support someone on your team with, dys with dyslexia, the first thing you can do is find out what core, core they read best on. What I mean by this is, um, it, it might be that they can read text easier on a green background. So, um, and if, if it's on a screen, you can, you, can, you can apply a green background, or if it's uh, a written piece of document, you actually get a, a, a green film that you put over the top, and then that makes it easier for them to read. Uh, it's also good to support important communications in more than one format. So say you, you, you need to send out a all-company email, s send a video, an audio recording with it as well, so that they're able to do that instead. And if you have a big policy document you have to read, like a security policy or GDPR, highlight the key points so that, 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 that they don't get missed. And explore supportive technology options. So screen readers can, can, can be really good if they're struggling re with reading or using things like um, Grammarly, which helps you with uh, your written communication. I use that all the time. Uh, and the final we're going to talk about is, is dyspraxia, uh, which is also no known as developmental coordination disorder. And uh, I'm going to refer to it as dyspraxia, because they're the ones I'm at full. But uh, dyspraxia is uh, for people who have challenges with coordination, balance and uh, movement, learning new skills, thinking and remembering information, writing, typing, drawing and grasping small objects, managing emotions and time management planning and organisational skill. And, they, and, those, and the actual symptoms are categorised into two categories. So we, we, we look at... Well, the first one is movement, so they might struggle, be clumsy, they might tire easily, and difficulty with writing and physical activities. And when it comes to the second one is coordination, um, bump into uh, people or objects, make a mess when eating, and have trouble with time management and planning. Now we understand the symptom dys dyspraxia in more detail, I want to look at the stereotypes like we did earlier. So, so starting with stereotypes that dyspraxia are just clumsy. The reality is that people with dyspraxia, are, 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 they tr even if they try their best to walk around things and be careful, uh, they end up bumping things and tripping things. The thing I walk into all the time is door handles. Uh, there is a stereotype that people with dyspraxia have low intelligence. How the reality is that for the people that struggle, str struggle with their, their fine motor skills and say picking things up off the floor, it's not, it's not because they have a lack of intelligence, it's not related at all. And there's a belief that people that dyspraxia are just disorganised. However, the reality is that they can put all the effort into the, wor the world. They'll try a new organisation strategy, and it'll, it'll still be, a, uh, be they'll still really struggle. And lastly, the stereotype that social awkward that they are social awkward 
it's really a difficulty in how they word and express themselves and makes more difficult to handle situation, social situations. So let's reframe um, some of those uh, symptoms around dyspraxia. So the first of the things is speak without thinking things through. And this can, and this can be re reframed as speaking literally and factually about things. We can also reframe how it might appear they're not listening to, as a preference. We can reframe how they appear to not be listening as a preference to observe situations and make mental notes. So they might be re-observant about what's happening in a meeting, but they might, they might not speak as, up, up as much. And, they're difficult, and a difficulty to read their writing can be re re reframed as like they're prioritizing just getting the information down. They, know they, don't, they, they, they might know that they, they struggle with, with the writing, but they're just prioritizing getting it down. So beyond, beyond the symptoms and stereotypes, there's, much be, there's, there's also been research on the strengths that come with dyspraxia. And the first of which is creative thinking, um, which can really help us push our products forward. They can excel at problem solving, like some of the other um, uh, neurodiversities. And, and, and quite often, they're, ve they're very sensitive to, to the needs of others. Um, so they're, they're really good ally for pushing for improving uh, inclusivity. And um, when it comes to recommending support systems, we ha uh, provide, making sure you provide clear and concise instructions to tasks. So if you could use a tool like JIRA for tickets, make sure that uh, you provide enough detail uh, up front. Uh, breaking, uh, breaking tasks down to the parts to avoid overwhelming. So don't give them a massive project just to work with on their own. Support them in breaking it down into a smaller, smaller pieces so that they, can, they don't feel overwhelmed by the project. Um, if they need to pick up a new skill, maybe the new project's going to be written in Rust because someone thinks that's the new trendy thing to do. Give them adequate time for learning those new skills. And, and make sure that they, ha they have ways to alert themselves for meetings. Um, I actually use a tool called In Your Face, which, which takes over my entire screen and just like, tells me you have a meeting. Cool. So that was a lot of downloading of what neurodiversity is. Now let's jump to um, In the Workplace because I want to focus more on what it's like to work in tech as a neurodivergent individual. To help me with this, what I've actually spent the past few months doing since Remy said he accepted the talk was asking um, other neurodivergent individuals uh, questions, like interviewing them, um, just to get, make sure that I cover things that they thought I should. So the first thing I want to talk upon is uh, making it clear that it's safe to share neuro that people's neurodiversities in your business. So when someone joins a business or is late diagnosed uh, with a neurodiversity, they will be unsure whether they share it with their employer. They will be th thinking whether they need to let HR know, whether they need to let their, their manager know, or, and even if they should tell their colleagues. And there's definitely advantages and disadvantages of, this, of, of, of telling these people. For example, if I, tell, if I let HR know that I have a disability, it should mean that they are able to help with any accommodations I might need, such as tools for, to aid writing and organisation. Letting your manager know uh, will, will help, you help, help you to figure out the best, best way for you to communicate and for them to adapt how they give you feedback. And letting your colleagues know might also help, you, help them collaborate with you better because they're able to understand when you're, you, 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 might, you might not be seeing things clearly. So, so, it's, so, the, pro so but the problem is that, it, that it isn't a given that any of these people will support you in the way that you expect. And unfortunately, it might even uh, be seen as just causing problems. So for me, I need to feel psychologically safe in a workplace to be able to tell people about, about these things. And while I don't expect my manager to be immediately knowledgeable of my needs, I want my manager who cares enough to want to learn and grow as a person as well. He's also seen this talk now, so he should now be an expert. <laughs> so um, we, we also, as, as businesses, we do a lot of training. So GDPR, anti-bribery, health and safety. And we should adapt, adapt to our training to take many forms. So we shouldn't have it just in an onboarding manual or in a pre-recorded video. We should, give, we should give them it in different, in multiple of these formats so that they can learn it quite quickly. And um, we should also, and, and, and while it is this impacts all, impacts all empl employees, we should make, make, make sure, particularly that we talk to any, our neurodivergent colleagues to make sure that we are doing a good job with our training. We should also adapt hiring and interview processes. 
So um, firstly, by being more accommodating with how we, re how we review CVs, by focusing on skills rather than grammatical capabilities. Then in the interview process, allowing the people to not turn on the camera on, in video interviews. On, for on-site interviews, using quiet meeting rooms for, co for the co and, and for, for if, if it's a coding exercise, give them the option to take it home or do it in the office. Because some people, the pressure of doing it in front of someone or even just pairing someone might be too high to allow them to perform their best. Or conversely, having that person with them might, might give them the actual drive to actually get the task done. So like, give them the choice. And we should be ensuring that we, we are using clear and concise com communication. They might struggle with sarcasm or jokes. So ensure that you make it clear if you're being sarcastic or making a joke as to avoid miscommunication. Be because I know I can be bad with uh, understanding this. I, when, I, when I make a joke, I put jokes in brackets all the time. <laughs> uh, and it can be hel hel helpful to use closed rather than open questions to ab avoid ambiguity and make, make sure there's no confusion. And another thing I think is really important to assume best intention in communication. Another, so I, th I think like we're all colleagues. I'm hoping we're all nice people and nice to work with. Um, so assume the best intent. And sometimes they might come across direct about something because it's something they feel is clear cut, or they might be wanting to respond in a timely manner. They might also try and push a certain idea of, of their own over, over others. Uh, however, this might just be a case, case of just being passionate. Rather than assuming the worst, try to clarify the situation and give them feedback if, they, if you think they could handle that communication in a better way, as they likely will appreciate it. Another way in which you can help your colleagues is be mindful of the is, is their focus time. While they, this will help your colleagues, your neuro, while this will help all your colleagues, your neurodivergent colleagues in particular will rely on that focus time to be able to just get the stuff done. And ensure the adequate spacing between meetings uh, so that people have time to decompress. I'm running out of time and I have a lot more content, so I'm going to rush now. <laughs> um, so um, use language based on how the, pe the, the person refers themselves. I think this one's really important. So there's two really common ways in which people might be referred to. In these examples, I'm going to use autism, but this can be interchanged with the neurodiversity. The first is to use person-first language, so to refer to someone as a person with autism. This puts the person first and the diagnosis second. The alternative is, is identity-first language, where someone might be referred to as an autistic person. The reason some people prefer this is because they feel it's an integral part of their identity. And that's how I feel. Since finding out that I'm autistic, I feel it's not something that I can change about myself. It's part of who I am. So I prefer the second. And this one I'll touch on very quickly is prioritise the needs of the few rather than convenience of the many. If there's something that your team's going to do which is going to be um, a problem for your neurodivergent colleagues, don't do it. <laughs> okay, so, so how we focus on this talk on, on how we can support our colleagues, let, let's talk about how we can be more inclusive in, 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 our, in our tech community. And yes, that is a photo from this conference. I'm in the middle. Uh, I, I will, uh, so the first one, thing I want to do is give people space. Um, so while it might be tempting if you see someone alone to start a conversation and introduce yourself, uh, you don't want them to feel, be feeling left out, be mindful that they might be taking a quiet moment for themselves. Uh, but because we want to give people space, we should also give them the opportunity to join in group conversations. And there's a really nice way to do this, I heard at another conference, and this is by standing in a Pac-Man formation. So the idea is that by leaving a gap, a gap, people can join the conversation. And then when we readjust the group, so, that, so that there's, there's always a gap, meaning more people can join. And this idea came from a guy called Eric Holscher. I'm probably saying that name wrong. I'm sorry if you see this talk. Uh, and uh, he gave a really good explanation of this. Leaving room for new people when standing in a group is a physical way to show an inclusive and welcoming environment. It reduces the feeling of there being cliques and allows people to integrate themselves into the community. And, if you, and then, uh, uh, it's really important. And then if you're, if you're the person that's organizing the event, this one's for Remy, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, share as much information as you can as, uh, as possible in plain language. And, and this is really important and avoids people feel anxious about the event and the day. And FFConf is actually really good at this. 
Uh, and the other one is make sure we, we establish feedback channels. So um, as an event organizer, give people opportunities to give feedback. And if there's something that you learn that's going to benefit other events, share it, blog about it, like make, make, uh, make all, all events better as an industry. I'm out of time, but I am wrapping up. <laughs> so today I hope you all learned more about many of the different kind of neurodiversity and how we can embrace their strengths. And as I start to wrap up, I want to re-emphasize the point I made at the beginning. Every neurodivergent person is going to be different, and so are any support needs they have. And through having empathy for our neurodivergent colleagues and the areas in which they might need our help, we can help them play to their strengths. And this will ultimately lead to us having more inclusive teams. I've, I've also put a list of uh, resources again on my website. Uh, I didn't do a QR code, but there's my website. And I, before I give the mic back to Remy, I have one last thought to leave you with. When we start to improve the way we organize our teams to be more accessible to those who are neurodivergent, we also improve them for everyone else. And there is a term for this, the curb cut effect, coined for when we adapt our streets for those less physically abled, we're able to improve them for everyone.